Hey. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? Doing all right. Nice to finally sort of meet you. Yeah. <laughs> all these years. Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's great to great to see you, man. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Where about are you right now? Whereabouts are you based? Uh, Austin, Texas. Oh man, I've been wanting to go to Austin since forever. Oh really? A uh, lot of opportunities, but it never came off. So uh, yeah. Have you always been based there, or have you moved there? I uh, know I've uh, was, you know originally from Florida, but I, I moved around a lot, so uh, just ping ponged a lot of places. So I just uh, I came here for South by Southwest, you know, in the in the early twenty two thousands, and I uh, always wondered like what's it like to live here when it's not a mess of people uh, <laughs> doing here, and uh, and I just uh, you know I moved down here about eight years ago almost, and. Uh, just uh just loving it yeah it's been great. no way man oh how cool yeah uh, so what time is it out there is it like gonna be what 2 p.m 2 30 uh it's about 3 30 ish past 30. Yeah. yeah so yeah and um and but you live in yorkshire is that right is that, is that correct yes yeah yeah, yeah. yes I, I did my research a little bit <laughs> and uh i was i was going through some old interviews and i was like it's like uh you're like you're very uh pro uh your hometown or your 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 home base unless it was your hometown but uh, i was just like it's like and you you, you, sh you shot a link to uh, uh google yorkshire yorkshire yeah yorkshire picks and i was just like yeah i would live i would live there too that's pretty nice <laughs> it's um it's an interesting place it's like um it's a bit like england's texas i guess it's it's huge yeah. lots of like lots of very naturally beautiful things here mm -hmm. uh, a lot of pride yeah. but it's got um it's it's the typical northern like part of England, so it's um, very working class. I, I really like it here. I get to leave here quite a lot, so I get to travel, which means I think if I stayed here full time, I'd get bored of it. Oh really? Okay. But getting to see enough of the places means that when I come back, it's uh, it's refreshing. Okay, cool. Yeah, it, well, that's a great place to come come home to. That's a great great home base. So exactly. But now now I want to travel there, so I think you're a good. Uh, Dude, let's return the favor. Let me uh, <laughs> let me find a reason to bring you to Yorkshire. You'll you'll enjoy it. I promise. All right, cool. I'd love to find a reason for you to get to Austin. So that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, oh, cool. Um, do you need me to record things my end? Do you want me to get my audio on um on my side or? Yeah, if you want to, that'd be great. Just in case uh, uh mine flicks out. Yeah. Well, so what what I normally do is I just record my audio on garage band so um at least you can get my side of things right okay straight from my mic so if that sounds all right yeah sounds great uh oh my <laughs> one second no. power no problem. Some power going on. Um, oh, what? Oh, okay, maybe I can't because <laughs> this is a new machine, and I just realised GarageBand isn't actually fully installed yet. So I've just opened it, and it's saying it's downloading about two point one gig. <laughs> so I'm going to have to kill that. Okay. No um, otherwise, it's going to Skype. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I can't grab stuff my end, but I guess you're. Uh, you weren't planning on that anyway, I guess. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's always good to have a backup in, in case you're, because uh, because uh, the you know what we're using right now. Sometimes, sometimes it's a little better now, but it sometimes in the past has reduced like tinny audio and it's been, so so. But uh, but yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. I'm sure it'll be good. Yeah. Cool, man. Cool. Uh, yeah. So I you know we're just gonna just kick things off, and uh, uh, one thing I, I found out is that uh, you're a Google developer expert. Is that right? Correct. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what does that mean? And mm -hmm. how did you how do you get to become a Google developer expert? So um no, so so what it means is that I'm someone who uh is not affiliated with Google. I don't work for Google, I'm not part of any of Google's commercial activities. Um, but the work I do is uh in a similar interest to what Google's is. So for example, uh, doing workshops about performance or teaching people like clients how to use DevTools more effectively. 
Uh, it's the kind of thing that Google appreciates people doing. Um, so they've got this kind of network of people that they endorse, for want of a better word. But it's a pretty sweet gig because um, you would then think that kind of, I have to say nice things about Google or I need to wear a Google t-shirt at every third conference. But they're really good about it. I've got no kind of gagging order. There is absolutely nothing to stop me getting on stage and saying how I think Google are evil. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> But I could, I could take exceptions to Google in a public forum. Uh, so there's no kind of um, gagging order or anything like that. So um, they just provide support to developers. Um, good example would be, let's say a country, an emerging market, an emerging economy is running a conference and they want me to come and speak. Now I work for myself, so I can't fly myself around places, but they might not be able to afford to fly me out either. I could go to Google and say, hey, look, this Indonesian conference really wants me to speak. Um, I'm going to do a talk about X, Y, and Z. Can you cover my flights in a hotel so that they don't have to? And then Google makes that cash available to people, who, developer experts. Mm. And then as for becoming an expert, uh, anyone can do it. Um, all you have to have is uh, someone on the inside at Google who would vouch for you. So um, if you've got friends in DevRel or, I mean, you'll know tons of people, right? So you could, you could just speak to someone in Google and be like, hey, um, you know, I, I want to become part of the developer expert network. Uh, and then you go through the interview process mm -hmm. and the second interview process and then they kind of vet you and then you, it's either a yay or a nay and you okay. get in. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, and the interview process is like, is it all day interviews or is it just like... No, no, it's, it's, really, it's really kind of... Um, it's, it's not intense. It's not all day. It's like a Skype call kind of thing. You don't have to go anywhere in person. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. That's pretty nice. Okay, I don't want to get too like, I don't want to like, you know, you give away all the secrets behind the, <laughs> behind the veil of Google Developer Expert. <laughs> so, but yeah, but I did, you know, I, I did notice like some people like, oh, I didn't know, like it makes sense that <clears throat> some people like, you know, I know like are Google Developer Experts. I didn't really see that until uh, I think uh, I don't know if you flew to uh, Google I/O this year. Oh, I missed it. I missed okay. it. Okay, yeah, because there was like a there's a group photo like Rachel Andrews was in it, and uh, I just like, oh, okay, cool. I didn't know she was a uh, Google developer expert, and I was like, okay, cool, that's pretty nice. But uh, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of smart people. No, it's, it's a really good way of Google of just kind of um, acknowledging people, or individuals who do uh, just general work in the web, right? Who are trying to progress the web. Um, I mean, you could quite easily write about how amazing uh, Firefox's grid implementation is, mm -hmm. but Google would still treat that as advancing the web, and they're very sort of neutral about it, which is really good of them. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty awesome. So, uh, we'll just talk about a little bit, like, so you're a Google developer expert, uh, you know, kind of like you got that, you know, uh, you know, thumbs up from Google uh, for the work that you do. So, like, what type of work do you normally do? Like, what, like, what, what type of, what's your normal week or, you know, day to day, I guess? Yeah. So, um, I guess the normal work I do uh, for, for clients is going to be a lot of, Auditing, consultancy mainly, so ad advising and strategy kind of stuff. Um, and that's nearly always on site, so I don't really do any remote work. So a normal week for me could be uh, early morning, like airports, you know, my alarm's going off at 6 a.m. tomorrow to get to uh, an airport to get to a client, so that kind of stuff. Uh, so lots of travel, which is um, incredible, like I'm the luckiest guy alive. But um, a lot of travel. Um, and then when I'm on site, it's usually going to be a lot of hands-on work. So I don't normally just sit and get my head down. It'll normally be get a bunch of engineers, a bunch of designers in a room. We just thrash things out. Okay. Um, so it's very kind of hands-on work, which is, which is what I really thrive on. Okay, so thrash things out, what does that mean? Like All right, so it'll just be like, um, so I normally, for better or worse, I get hired at two different stages in a project. Okay. One, when it's brand new and it's exciting, or two, when it's gone completely downhill, right? <laughs> when it's just firefighting. So thrashing things out would be, we all get in a room and we just sling everything we know at the wall, we sling all the potential solutions, and we just see what sticks. So it's a case of, we all just, it's kind of like a, I don't want to say crisis zone because that sounds really bad, right. but it's kind of uh, the stage you'd get to where you're just getting everyone uh, all hands on deck and just really, really hands on work. Okay. Okay, cool. 
Yeah. Um, uh, there's just a little bit of noise in the background. Is there? Is there? Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of noise. Um, yeah. My girlfriend's like trying to really silently put away uh, groceries, <laughs> but um, she's done now. She's done. She's done. She's done. Yeah. <laughs> So I, if, if you make oh, it, she's apologizing. It's fine. No, no, it's fine. It's cool. I was like, it, it, to be honest, like if I had to make a guess as to what the noise was, it would be uh, girlfriend putting away groceries. That's, that would be better. <laughs> <That's solid. laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's all good now. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. So, um, sorry, I just want to follow up. So, so th thrashing things like so, start a project when everything's great. Or did you say like also when things aren't that great? Is that is the other thing? <clears throat> yeah. So um, there are two main times when some someone would hire a consultant, and yeah, the first one is when you've got a brand new greenfield project and you want to do it. You you want to do it right this time. Famous last words. But um, <laughs> or the other one is when uh, a really mature project is a lot of legacy, a lot of technical debt, a lot of things aren't going too well at all. Um, and they just need someone to come in and say, look, we've got this 10 year old like legacy code base. We can't rewrite it for another two years. What do we do to kind of tweak out that last couple of years worth of longevity or, or, you know, um, we can't afford to rebuild the entire application at all. Uh, we need to refactor the whole thing. So I see, I, I get to see either the best or the worst of a project, <laughs> depending on what the, what the project is. And then, and so it sounds like, like, do you do a lot of uh, like coding on their project types? Or like, like, do you get on their code or do you just go there and, and, and um, actually like kind of like just, you know, I just, I guess, I guess I'm trying to get a feel for like, you know, if, if we're to, if I were, if I had a major project and we're in, not in a great situation right now and things are like, you know, you know, we were like, we need better performance. Uh, what would it, what, what, you know, and you get us all, all the engineers in the room. Like, what type of things would you expect us to have, or would, would you expect them to like for for me to give to you, in order for us to work? And it's fun. To, yeah, that's a question. No, no, it makes complete sense. Um, so I guess it does. It does depend on what the client needs. So if the client has got um, a really strong engineering team and they just need guidance, I would do very little dev work. I would come in and say, "Hey, look, show me what you've got. Right. What do you like about this? What do you feel is a bottleneck?" And I might refactor things in a very kind of, um, I don't know, like uh, informal way. Um, so a lot of the audit and performance improvement work that I do would be a case of here, look, I've made a little like uh, a little experiment branch okay. uh, and I've committed some stuff in there that is like proof concept. You need to work out if it's appropriate for you. You need to work out exactly how you're going to integrate it into the code base. But if you go in this kind of direction, then that that work. So uh, it goes from being really hands off. It goes from being really kind of just guidance. Right. But then, for example, today I was with a client, um, the NHS. They do all England's like healthcare services. Right. Um, working on a project for them, and I've just spent the last two days writing code nonstop. So for them, I'm actually building out a full kind of UI toolkit for them, like a, a pattern library style guide, whichever whichever one we want to call it. Yeah. So for them, I'm writing a lot of code, uh, which is great because I think it's really important to keep your like keep yourself in each kind of camp, I guess. Right. I don't. They couldn't think of much worse than being a consultant who hasn't written a line of code for five years. Uh, so it's given me a real chance to just roll my sleeves up and get stuck into get stuck into what everyone in this industry industry fell in love with in the first place. I guess okay. just getting to write a lot of code. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So cool. So it sounds like it just you know it really depends on the situation, what what the what the team wants. But like you're very flexible in terms of like coming to them and, and working working things out and so uh Absolutely. so usually people will call you and say like which uh you know sorry if i feel like i'm just pestering you but like what's your job but i felt like your job was like really awesome as, <laughs> as someone who's into css a lot and i was just like wow that's, that's awesome just to just to fly in help people with css problems and fly out so um not fly out but just like hey show them away the then then, then uh, yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah but uh you know, come like zoro just come in like hey come on and then um uh, so, the, so, what was the other question? So, so do people just? What type of problems do people call you about during this? Is, is it performance? Is it uh, you know, uh, uh, cl a clash of CSS rules, specificity issues? Is it is it something like that? Is that? So, what's really interesting about what I do is the fact that um, it's really hard to get your head around the fact that someone's job can be CSS, right? Like. 
because because what you said makes complete sense but i don't think anyone's ever technically flown me out somewhere because of like a specificity issue yeah but that's the exact kind of stuff that's exactly the kind of stuff i'm fixing right. but normally i get involved at a way more kind of uh like an organizational level i guess mm -hmm. so the problem would actually be something more like hey look we had a really quick mvp kind of stage right we've got this product together we know that it works. We've got to make it last for the next five years. But our biggest bottleneck right now is that we've got one designer and eight backend developers trying to write CSS. Right. So what I would probably do is go in and say, okay, well, your designer is working like this. None of you are really proficient with CSS because that's not your job. Right. So I would do stuff like, how do we find a workflow that's going to mean that you can scale your team? Or sorry, you can scale your code base without needing to scale a team. Right. That's going to be one of the problems that I would normally solve. Or the other one is the, the 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 kind of the refactoring gig where someone sort of brings up like, hey Harry, look, we've got like a million types of button, we've got eighteen different types of accordion, we've got a new designer who's doing a design audit, and we want to just sanitize the entire look and feel and make sure it's like uh, nice and tidy, and we also want to roll it out across three different applications rather than just one, and we need to theme it and we need to do this kind of stuff. So it would be kind of end to end. My my work kind of starts with the design process. I always joke that I'm a failed designer. I always wanted to be a designer, but just can't make things look nice. Um, which is kind of key to being a designer. So what I ended up doing was fully understanding and appreciating the design process. So I get embedded in design teams more than engineering teams. Okay. Uh, I champion them. I facilitate them. One thing I find is that nearly every company I've worked with, uh, the amount of engineers mm -hmm. is way, way, way higher than the amount of designers. So the designers are always on the back foot. They're always kind of trying to play catch up. Right. So my job is to kind of champion them, facilitate them, and just make their work a one-to-many relationship. One designer can still service three applications rather than mm -hmm. them just being worn out. Uh, and also things like how do we let, how do we enable software engineers to implement or even write CSS whilst doing minimal damage? You can always tell when an interface is being built by an engineer or designed by an engineer. So I, I kind of, I kind of try and occupy that middle ground where. I keep everyone as happy as possible and keep everything as safe and like, well guarded as possible, I guess. Okay. Uh, so I guess there's a lot of things I want to follow up on that one. Uh, but uh, I guess what tips do you have or, or tricks do you use to like scale engineers to understand CSS more when you have uh, that set of that offset of like, you know, one CSS designer to like eight plus or many, many engineers? Like, like, like how, so that's that's such a good question. So there are a few tips, right? Okay. One of them, one of them is just just don't tell them everything. Or, or to reword that slightly, a lot of backend developers, a lot of software engineers, just do not care about CSS, and they never will care about CSS, and that's fine. Right. That's completely fine. Like it's not their job to care about CSS. So if you think you might be working within a company where they have those kind of people. Uh, what you want to do is you want to safeguard as much of the complex stuff. So any of the architectural decisions, hide them behind something. Hide them inside like a, hey, look, here's the framework. Um, don't worry about what's going on in here. It's a version dependency. Don't go in there. It's fine. Just trust us. And then for those kind of backend developers who just want to consume, uh, that's when you've got your kind of internal framework, which is just, hey, this is your effect of your API. Use this class to do this. Use this class to do this. Okay. So... At the very, very most, like uh, guarded level, is just don't don't bore them with things they don't care about. Just it's fine. You don't need to know about it. It works. Just trust us. If you use these classes, they will always work. Okay. If we're going to deprecate them, we'll give you deprecation warnings, and you've got enough time to react. Okay. If you've got software engineers who do care a bit more about CSS, and I'm finding that more and more because software engineers they enjoy a challenge. Uh, they always want to learn something new. Is um, one of the key things I've done over the last few years is actually study software engineering principles and sort of take traditional computer science methodologies from the 60s, 70s, 80s and apply those to CSS. So whereas CSS was traditionally seen as a really kind of toy language, you know, color red, uh, almost like offensively simple, yeah. um, that's why a lot of people gloss over it. Whereas what I would try and do is say, hey, look, do you know that thing that you told us about, that thing called cyclomatic complexity? And you see the software engineers like, yeah, we know what cyclomatic complexity is. And it's like, well, that happens in CSS as well. And the way it happens in CSS is X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And all of a sudden you see light bulbs turn on like, oh, yeah, I guess it does. Right. Um, 
I think general advice that I've given out to a lot of developers over the years is only tell people what they want to hear. <laughs> like, like as, you know, don't tell project managers you've got a specificity issue because they don't care. It's not their job to care. Tell them that you've got a niggly bug that you're going to try and solve. Don't tell, uh, don't tell programmers about Flexbox. Tell them about cyclomatic complexity. Yeah. It's the easiest way to get someone on side is if they are already preconditioned uh-huh. to hearing what you're telling them, they're going to absorb it way quicker. Right. I mean, like, I laugh because that's it's so so true. Um, it really is. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, because like you know, you want to, you know, you know, if you uh, you want to speak their language, I think is what is a better kind of a more polite way. Uh, of correct. That. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like, and uh, people do don't want to get bogged down. Like, like when you know, if a plumber comes and fixes the pipes, I really do not need to know about piping. Like uh, exactly right. Situations. I just. I want to make sure my system is not sinking. Yeah. Exactly. Because if your plumber comes around and starts telling you about like, oh, well, this U-band was invented in the 70s, you're just like, dude, I think you might be scamming me. Like, I don't know enough <laughs> yeah. to challenge what you're saying. Therefore, I think I might be getting ripped off. Yeah. Whereas if your plumber just says, look, that was pretty nasty. You need to keep an eye on things a bit more. You need to make sure you're not like flushing rocks down the sink. Um, but I fixed it. It's like, oh, okay, I understood all of that. Therefore, I trust you. And I think a lot of it, yeah, exactly. The plumber analogy is a good one. I'll probably use that. Thank you. No problem. It's, it's all good, <laughs> man. Uh, so, uh, so what tools do you use? Like, you know, uh, do, is it is it just like, you know, I assume uh, Chrome developer tools and, you know, web page test. Is it is there anything more than that? Or is it uh, anything else than that? Or is it, you know, do you have your own yeah. collection? So, um, well, of course, you named the single most important one, which is DevTools. Um, could not live without that. Um, uh, so when it's for performance work, uh, web page test, I think, is just the most amazing bit of kit. I, I think web page test is is just such a fantastic, powerful tool. So I use that every time I do any performance testing. Um, other things for performance work, um, Charles Proxy. Um, don't know if you've used Charles much before, but um, the main thing I use there is you can selectively throttle individual domains. So I can, when I'm testing a client's website, I can just tell my entire machine, any request from this client's website, slow that down to 3G, but leave my entire machine running on Wi-Fi. So Spotify still works, Netflix still works. So I use Charles a lot for performance stuff. Um, Speed Curve for monitoring performance. Uh, That's a really great tool. Um, so performance, performance things, it's mainly going to be dev tools, uh, web page test, and, and Charles, things like that. Okay. Uh, for CSS, there's an amazing tool. Um, I guess we can put these in the show notes, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, there's a tool called Parker. And Parker was, uh, well, it was, it was born right here in Yorkshire. Uh, and Parker's a really, nice, a really nice command line tool where um, it's just Parker and then path to stylesheet.css. And it'll just do some static analysis. Um, it'll just read over the style sheet and it'll give you back reports on uh, how many ID selectors it found, what the highest specificity selector is, what the average specificity per selector is, mm. how many importance were used. So when I come to a legacy project, um, I use Parker just to see generally what's wrong. And I'll, it shows you the worst offender. So it shows you that this is the top specificity selector. It's got five IDs and you know six classes in it. So that tells me, well, we'll start here. We'll start refactoring this first. Um, so Parker is amazing. Uh, there's a GUI, um, not competitor. There's a very similar tool called cssstats.com, which is a much more GUI-oriented way of doing things. Yeah. That's really good if you've got any design debt. So if you're working with teams where they've got you know 15 shades of green and a million shades of blue, this gives you really visual feedback about your style sheets. So CSS stats. Um, and then other just command line utilities. So I do a lot of audit work. I join a lot of kind of mature and um, legacy applications where there could be I don't know, a million lines of code. So things like ACK, ACK, if yeah. you've used ACK before, is, is great for just searching through um, searching through projects, C tags, things like that. So I can start to build like a bit of a topology of a project without having to have 10 years experience with it. Okay. Um, that's for the auditing and kind of that, that work. Oh, nice. Okay. But, yeah. Cool. That's awesome. That's some great tools. Yeah. So Chrome, you know, Chrome Dev Tools is is you know number one for everyone, I think. Uh, Absolutely. So how did you know? I still feel like I'm 
I have butter hands, if that's a word or expression, uh, <laughs> when I use it. So how do you feel like any tips on becoming a master or better at Chrome Dev Tools? Like, well, what do you usually use Chrome Dev Tools for? I guess is another way of saying that. It's like, how yeah. Do you better at? Well, so one thing I find really interesting about Dev Tools is there's the obvious stuff we've been using forever, like, you know, right click inspect element. That doesn't really change. But the problem comes with things like the timeline profiling tools. Uh, they change, like, so like Chrome's developers update how the dev tools work so often that often their, their documentation becomes out of date. Mm -hmm. So you'd be reading docs that are like maybe only two weeks old, but they're already out of date. Right. So um, just a lot of experimentation, a lot of um, designing test cases and thinking, well, I don't know how this feature of dev tools works, but if I break this bit of the page, mm -hmm. does this, does this dev tools thing change? Yeah. So I do a lot of kind of almost reverse engineering, oh, wow. but mm -hmm. my, but um, my biggest secret is just keeping uh, keeping on top of the Canary uh, updates. So uh, in Canary's dev tools, I actually have a what's new panel. Okay. And the what's new panel will give you effectively a change log of whatever's happened inside of in Chrome's dev tools. Okay. Uh, for more high level stuff, there's a guy called, um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong because I'm just terrible, Umar Hansath. Yeah. Um, and he's, um, we'll put, definitely put a link to his stuff in the show notes. Yeah. He's got a, like a, a dev tools newsletter okay. and once a week you just get like a little animated gift showing you oh, how yeah. to do one specific. Yeah. 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 You subscribe yeah, to that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So like there's some absolute, like a lot of the stuff in there I already know because it's like kind of my job to be in dev tools, right. but every, every now and again, there's something that's like, Oh, I had no idea that existed yeah. and it changes everything. Okay. So, um, his, he's a real treasure trove for stuff like that. Okay, cool. Yeah. I've never like ever since the, uh, Netscape navigator betas of three <laughs> i've i've uh, i've never really been a browser beta supporter so just how bad they were that was back in the day yeah. so um, but uh but i definitely will try canaries i guess more well the last update to canary the actual network tool stopped working yeah. so i use canary for a lot of like really bleeding edge performance tools right. and the network panel just completely doesn't yeah. work in canary at the moment it's just gone right um, so that's the, that's the risk you run. So all of my normal dev work and browsing work happens in stable, right. but if I want to do some really forensic things, I'll fire open Canary and, okay. and we'll see what's going on. Okay. I guess this is a stupid question, I guess, but, uh, can you have Canary and the regular Chrome at the same time or? Are yeah, they're completely sandboxed. So they've got, um, one kind of annoying thing or well, not annoying, but, um, any custom flags you turn on in your, in your regular Chrome, you have to double up the work because they are completely sandboxed. Right. You have to then log into, you have to go into Canary and turn on all the exact same features there as well. Okay. Um, the benefit of that is like say, complete sandboxing, right. but it does mean that if you turn on a sweet new feature in Chrome, you've got to go do the exact same leg work in Canary. Okay. All right. Well, that's not too much trouble. I mean, like, you know, back in the it's day, worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. Like back in the day, you actually had like uninstalled, reinstalled browsers. It's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Just buy a whole new computer. Oh, I wish, man. That was, that'd be awesome. Uh, cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, uh, engineers who don't know CSS or don't want to know CSS, like you said before, I won't go back to this. Like, you're totally cool with with them not knowing CSS because it's not part of their job. Uh, can you shed light on CSS and JS uh, and uh, what what does that mean exactly? Because I feel like um, there's a tweet. I, I'm going to have to find this tweet, but I was just like, I'm, and I'm going to go find the tweet, and then I'm going to figure out because uh, I'm going to butcher the, the phrasing of it. But just like, <laughs> there's one is like CSS is too hard, uh, is what, what engineers say, and then also CSS C, uh, CSS is too hard. We need to put it in JavaScript, and CSS is too simple. Uh, we shouldn't have it. Pretty much, it's like you know, basically like the same argument from engineers. It's like. <laughs> it's it does seem fairly paradoxical. I mean, my my beef with the whole CSS and JS thing um, is that it's just born. Like I I've done CSS for like ten years now. Yeah. I've done it on consultancy basis, genuinely for some of the biggest companies in the world for the last four years. Okay. You can scale CSS. Okay. The only reason people struggle with it is because no one bothers to learn it properly. Yeah. Uh, no one really has the discipline or diligence. And what's really galling for me is the fact that um, instead of people saying, do you know what, we need to hire some specialists, so we need to hire dedicated uh, front-end developers who only know HTML, CSS, and, and who are 
it's their job to make sure it's it's good. Instead of doing that, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. They um, take CSS away from designers and front-end developers. They bring it into the fold of software engineers. So now all of a sudden, people who were happy writing basic HTML, CSS, and doing design work, they now have to have a thorough understanding of JavaScript. Maybe not thorough, but they need to understand JavaScript now, or they need a way more complex tool chain. And it's gone from, uh, I just feel it's like an air of um, almost arrogance, um, where in which in which people have said, well, do you know what? We couldn't be bothered learning CSS properly, so we've decided to just re-implement it wholesale in the thing that we do understand and it kind of leaves everyone else just thinking, oh, wow, well, we were we were quite happy doing this properly. But now I guess I've got to completely change how I work because you, you know, the software engineers have decided to make it their realm now. Right. So for me, the kind of philosophical argument behind CSS and JS is um, it's not a nice one. I don't like it from that point of view. Right. Um, obviously, what you've got to remember as well is it doesn't actually solve that many problems. It doesn't. You still have the cascade. Right. You still have inheritance. All it will really give you is co-location and random class names. Yeah. So you'll still, if you nest something inside something else, it could still turn the wrong color, or your buttons could could, could accidentally become underlined. So it doesn't guard you against anything that people, or what people assume it does. Yeah. It gives you co-location and it gives you random class names, so you don't get naming collisions. It actually doesn't solve very much that traditional CSS hasn't solved already. I think things like uh, web components that will give you co-location insofar as um, all your components live together, but they're still in CSS is in CSS, HTML is in HTML, JavaScript is in JavaScript, but it does give you shadow DOM, so it does give you complete encapsulation. Like, that's the gold standard. However, to play devil's advocate, I also think there's a bit of hypocrisy. Um, when SAS was invented, we were writing our CSS in Ruby, and no one cared. No one made it, no one cared we were writing CSS in Ruby. Uh, when less was invented, we're writing. Well, when less was invented, we were writing our CSS in Node, which is JavaScript. So less is technically CSS in JavaScript. So if you if you view CSS in JavaScript as just being like a pre-compiler, yeah. um, then it is really no different to SAS or Node uh, or, or less, for example. Um, so for me, the beef isn't with the technology. My issue is way more with the the philosophy of why it exists in the first place. It kind of feels like a bit of a um, Hey, look, we're really clever software engineers. We all graduated Harvard. We're all like CS students. Right. We don't really understand the front end, so we decided to do what we know best, and we reinvented it for you. Right. And it kind of like, well, you've got you don't really understand like decades of the web, like as a as a, as a philosophy behind us. So yeah, my beef is way more philosophical. This is a good one for like down the pub with a beer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. If I could, if I could, I would slide you one right now. But uh... we can pick it up in New Orleans. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, just, I feel like, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, JavaScript is everywhere, and I just feel like it, it's only natural for, you know, once they've, you know, once engineers are like, oh, we've, we've conquered the server, let's go and uh, n knock off this uh, this designy <laughs> bit, you know, and see what happens. So, and uh, they, I think they find out that it's just not that simple. Uh, to yeah. that. I mean, there's lots of reasons why it took years to get style sheets right, you know, in the browser and, and, uh, and everything like that, so. It's not, it's not absolutely actually, but yeah so i mean i still remember you know ie trying to get style sheets right um they're still trying yeah that's right. <laughs> <That's> so <laughs> nasty of me yeah. oh you're actually doing amazing work as well yeah they, they're, they're doing great so uh um but yeah okay so yeah i just feel like uh yeah i just but i feel like i'm also like kind of like a guy who's been doing css forever and so to see J javascript kind of like trying to usurp you know, you know, they totally can, and they do what they wanted when they want to do with CSS. But I just feel like it's, it's like a, the gains as you as you mentioned aren't that aren't that many, to to, to exactly. get get out of it. If they just you know maybe took a day workshop with you and they're like, oh okay, I got it now. So, and and, and working with that. So, but uh, but yeah, but then it's just like oh, how many like how many engineers will really, you know, you say like in your, in your workshops, you know, how many engineers are actually gonna come to your workshops or. You know, private or, or whatnot. It's like, hey, I'm going to actually want to learn something new, rather than try to like bring it into my own domain instead, like that. So, but yeah, so it just yeah. Of... Keep, I'm just going to keep on fighting the good fight. <laughs> I think is what I'm going to do. I'll do my bit. All right, cool. Um, so in doing research, uh, it, it was a kind of a dated interview, but I felt like it was it had a number of. Uh, so I felt like, oh, this is a good thing to bring up. So it was like, there, you wish browser support four things, and uh, CSS Grid. 
web components, all initial and custom properties. And so uh, CSS grid, which is like CSS layouts, if you will, uh, custom properties are, you know, is another name for CSS variables. Is that right? Is that good? Correct. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the two things I, I would like to explain more is just, uh, you mentioned web components earlier. Um, I have a vague notion of what web components is, but if you can just explain what that, what, what, what they are and how uh, people listening can, like, you know, can benefit from, from that, as well as um, all initial as well, too. That'd be great. Cool. So web components, um, web components is a formal kind of spec, formal standard, which basically defines encapsulated bits of UI. So let's say, um, let's say you're a restaurant and you, um, you, you use a third party to do bookings for tables. Now, normally, you probably put an iframe on your site, and the iframe communicates back to the third party and does all the booking that way. Uh, the reason we use an iframe is just to get that sandbox, whereas what web components do would give us that kind of sandbox. Um, but, okay, maybe that's not the best analogy, because it's not like iframes at all. But what I mean is it gives us the kind of encapsulation that an iframe might give us, but we could use it within our own projects. Oh, what's so, what, what's that? Your mic gave out? So. Oh, um, how far shall I roll back? Uh, just, uh, just like two sentences, I think. So, or just uh, the iframe part was you know, like the restaurant example. I think that's pretty much. So, restaurant iframe. Oh yeah, yeah. So, like, what a web component would give you is if you've got um, like a, a widget that is on your site that's fairly self-contained. It's got its own little responsibility, uh, like a booking widget or a little calendar date picker kind of thing. Uh, a web component could wrap that up into its own custom template, and you'd use custom tags like or custom element like a um, you know date picker, similar to HTML5, but you can invent your own tags in or elements, I guess. Okay. Custom element called date picker. Uh, date picker would have its own shadow DOM. So shadow DOM means that um, anything from outside of the page can't leak in. So you could do like on the main document, you could do star font weight bold important. And that would not leak into your custom element because it's got shadow DOM. It's completely encapsulated, completely safeguarded. Um, and then we get co-location. So that custom template uses uh, its own JavaScript file, its own CSS file, and they all run in this kind of this, this, this isolated context. So that means that we can still use the technologies we know and love. We can still write CSS and CSS, write JavaScript and JavaScript, HTML and HTML. So we get all the benefit of everything we know and love. Um, but we also get all these extra goodies as well. Uh, if anyone's interested in experimenting with web components, um, uh, in, enough browsers support them that you can experiment. But um, Polymer by Google is uh, a decent polyfill. So Polymer is a good way of experimenting with um, uh, with web components. Uh, I don't know if I can name them, but I was working with a client uh, last year, huge American corporation, uh, the ninth biggest company on the planet. Um, they're building applications that are going to be used or implemented by 40,000 software engineers, okay. and they're using Polymer. So it's it's big enough, it, it's stable enough for enormous companies to be using this stuff. Um, so that, that's web components in quite a, a big nutshell. Okay. And all initial, yeah. uh, all initial is unreal. The amount of people who haven't heard of all initial who then proceed to get their minds completely blown by it, mm -hmm. that never gets old. Okay. <laughs> All initial basically is um, it sets all properties to their initial values. So it effectively stops inheritance. So if you had an HTML page with uh, body, font weight bold, HTML color red, any bit of text in there you would expect to be bold and red, right? Because of the cascade, uh, not the cascade through, because of inheritance. Um, if you were to put a span in the middle of that page, sure enough, it would turn bold and red. But as soon as you do span all initial, it goes back to being black, and uh, regular font weight. Wow. So all initial just sets all properties back to their initial value. Yeah. Uh, it effectively stops inheritance. Right. Yeah. Browser support is pretty. There's a lot of when you go to caniuse.com. There's a lot of green, right, which yeah. looks really, really, really reassuring. Right. But um, there are two really concerning bits of red, and that's IE and Edge. So basically, yeah, all initial. Uh, it effectively stops inheritance. It, it will reset any DOM node back to how it would have looked with just browser styles applied to it. Right. So it will strip off anything it's inherited. So this is really useful if you're 
I'm sure you've been on projects before, right? Where it's like a 12 year old website and the client says, oh, can you add this new feature to the homepage? And you spend all your time defensively undoing other people's mess. It's like, oh, why is it turning red? Oh, it's because of this. Why is it floated right? Oh, it's because of this. Just drop all initial in there and it will just go back to having browser styles and then you get to start from scratch again. Um, so all initials, perfect. It's so good. All right, awesome. Yeah, so I assume that if you do apply all initial that you can just also in the same blocks write new CSS rules for, for that element or as well so that you can, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So you put like class equals new thing. A new thing would have um, all initial, which sets it back to Times New Roman Black. Then right underneath all initial, you could say Helvetica, 12 pixels, oh, nice. whatever, whatever. So you can use all initial first to get back to zero and then straight after it, start writing your new CSS, right. um, which is uh, which is really great. Awesome, so it's like a mini reset, CSS reset, right? It, it, it's exactly that. It's like a one line reset that only affects specific DOM nodes where you, where you drop it onto. Um, and oh, it's amazing. And I just wish, you can do really crude workarounds. So um, if you if you put like all initial onto any element, just open like inspector and put all initial on something on a page. Then you click on the um, computed styles for that DOM node. Right. You will see a list like three meters long that says, you know, background position zero, zero, background repeat none or whatever. So it shows you what it all computes to. So if you want to do a really nasty workaround to support old browsers, you just copy and paste that entire <laughs> list of um, computed styles and put that in a mix in somewhere or put it in an IE style sheet and just extend it maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're working in modern browsers, all initials, um, all initials perfect, especially if you're working with legacy code. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, that does blow, blow my mind. Thank you so much for that. So that's pretty awesome. So uh, yeah, I need, now I need to find out who I need to uh, yell at to, at uh, the browser vendors to, uh, to get <laughs> <laughs> that's, so, that's a good point actually. I'm sure we could go and look at the um, IE kind of roadmap and see where all initial is. If it's not even on there, we should definitely start yeah. putting it on and voting it up. Right, now that we have Flexbox and CSS Grid, I think we're like, I think that's a, a good thing to pick up. So Absolutely. After that, that's awesome. Cool. Um, uh, your views on SAS versus post CSS? Or you sound like you're a SAS person, so. I'm a SAS person, um, mainly because it's what I've been using for so long. Um, I, I, I don't have like a one versus the other. It's such a politician's answer, but I don't have like a one versus the other. Yeah. So some interesting tooling I've been doing lately is to use a bit of both. Right. So use SAS for the things that it's good at, mm -hmm. and then pass the, um, so for example, writing all your variables in pure CSS custom properties instead of SAS variables, okay. um, using those in your SAS files, uh, just but, but as vanilla CSS, uh, compiling that down so your compiled CSS still uses CSS variables, but then passing that CSS file through post CSS and then compiling that down to static CSS afterwards. So it means you can start using really new features, run it through SAS, then for old browsers, run it through post CSS. So a tool chain that involves both is quite nice. Um, but yeah, I'm still for the most part using SAS because I work with companies who. I work with companies who've got code that has only just started using SAS anyway, and they can't, they've got so much legacy that they can't switch technologies very quickly. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, just, just throwing it out there, like how many, I mean, do you, most of the companies now have responsive websites now, or do you still or you deal with companies that have fixed layouts still? Or like, Good question. I think nowadays, I think most companies I've worked with have, in fact, I would say nearly all companies I've worked with have a responsive site, or if it isn't responsive, they at least have a decent MDOP site instead. Okay. I haven't worked with a company for a long, long time who's got fully like fixed layout pages, right. um, which is good. I've never even thought about that. But that actually, is, that's quite a good. That's quite good that I'm getting to work with companies who are mm -hmm. adopting stuff, or it's good that companies are adopting things that quickly. Right, and do you, is it is it really good to say decent M that site? I don't think that's really. I don't think you use the words decent and M site in the same. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is a big question. I actually think there's a time and place for both, so I don't. <laughs> I I'm not. Answer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm. I'm not. I think responsive. If you can do a responsive site, do it. Absolutely. Right. The just the business case alone of build once and supply everywhere right. is amazing. You know. 
it's a last resort to use an M.site, site, but right. certain websites just can't be made responsive. Right. And I know everyone says that, well, you're not trying hard enough, but genuinely I've worked on projects where you cannot have a responsive, like a betting applications. I used to work on a, uh, for a gambling company. Yeah. Uh, making those kind of applications responsive is really difficult. Yeah. Um, they're more dashboardy, so completely different design paradigms uh, are often a requirement. Right. But uh, ultimately, ideally, I would like to see responsive everywhere. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I just, yeah, you know, sometimes the M sites are just, just terrible. So <laughs> that's why I can make. Yeah. Made well, better. on the flip side, though, even on desktop, I still go to Wikipedia's M dot site. Oh yeah. I think the m wikipedia org is so much nicer than their mobile uh, than their desktop site oh, really? that I actually use m dot everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm trained as a Wikipedia user just to enjoy. I know how to get my way around Wikipedia's desktop site. I never really thought about their mobile version. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. That's Stockholm syndrome right there. Yeah, exactly. I need to <laughs> show me the way out, man. I need to uh, you open the door. So. You're not, you're, not, you're not captured anymore. You take off. Uh, <laughs> one thing uh, I read an interview. Uh, you know, you're speaking at CSS DevConf in October. Um, oh yeah. And so, yeah, it's in New Orleans. It'd be awesome. Um, and uh, I read some interviews about uh, marketing yourself, marketing yourself, and that, uh, uh, and that you know you you, did, you didn't go to college, so you actually um, kind of like put your effort into your online uh, persona, I guess, you know, CSS Wizardry is, is your website. And so, which is uh, a great thing. So like one of the things, you know, I try and point this into, uh, you know, your thoughts on marketing yourself, you know, as, as and get your name out there. Like, how do you feel um, where you are now? Cause I feel like, cause in the, in the past interview, you said like, you want to make sure you write quality posts over quantity, which is a great thing. Uh, but then also I just want to, just uh, if there's any words of encouragement for other people who might be listening and you also want to be speakers or more known in the industry. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I get asked this quite a lot because I think, um, I think a lot of a common misconception is that I've always had kind of a, a name or always had a bit of a presence. Right. Uh, but what uh, my, I started blogging 10 years ago. It's taking taking a long time. Now there are shortcuts. There are definitely shortcuts. So you could um, you could register a domain name and just hammer out millions of articles, uh, not of necessarily low quality, but of just kind of rapid fire stuff to quickly kind of scattergun um, and, and build up kind of. I guess that's kind of a strategy that a social media company might tell you to take. Is just like have an updated Twitter profile, have the list, have the list. Um, my advice is kind of quantity, uh, quality over quantity, absolutely, um, slow and steady. Um, but here's one thing that most people who ask me this question, I get it asked a lot at workshops and conferences when there are a lot of junior developers around. Yeah. A lot of people ask me, like, oh, how, how, did, how did you get where you got to? How did you be, get to become like a, you know, how did you get to where you got to? Right. I almost singularly attribute it to having a blog. I think having a blog is the single most valuable thing I've ever done. Right. And then the next thing I say to them is, do you have a blog? And everybody always says no. And I'm like, well, your, your homework this weekend is start a blog. And don't start on Medium. Don't go to Medium and set up a Medium blog. Okay. Go and build yourself a crude, nasty, just cheap and cheerful blog on your own domain mm -hmm. and just write stuff down. And then they say things like, this conversation always goes the same way. It's yeah. like, well, people, people, people won't read it. It's like, well, if you don't have it, they literally can't read it. Yeah. If you don't have a blog, it's impossible for them to read it. But just by having a blog, there are an infinite amount of times more likely that people are going to be reading your blog. So just having it. Right. And then they say things like, oh, well, yeah, but I, I should have started five years ago. You know, like, it's too late to kind of start now. And there's an old, this sounds really kind of tacky and really cheesy and very like twee, but there's an old proverb, which is um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Right. Second best time to plant a tree is right now. So a lot of people go into this kind of like um, this, well, not fallacy, but this kind of this thought process of, well, if I was going to be, if I was going to do blogging, I should have started it five years ago. It's like, well, you should have done, but you didn't. So start it now. Right. Don't start it in five years time. Start it now. Go home tonight. Just get a Jekyll blog, get a horrible, cheap WordPress theme, just something. Because you don't know what's going to happen. I think the way I got 
kind of more well known is I was just writing stuff kind of just to no one in particular. I didn't have a following. I was just writing things that as I was learning them, I was sharing them. Cause I was like, Oh, this is really cool. Like, this new CSS three thing does this. And I would just blog about it just because that's how I learned. I learned from other people's generosity. Right. So I was like, oh, just, that's what people do. We, we blog things and no one was reading it. And then one day, uh, smashing magazine picked up on one of my articles and they tweeted it. Uh-huh. And this was in 2009, I think. Yeah. And, uh, all of a sudden, people were hitting my site, and it had like more traffic than it ever had before. And because I was on Smashing Mag's radar, they would share more things, they would share other things. Um, so yeah, I think the single biggest thing anyone could do is have a blog. And then after that, it's things like go and speak at meetups. Yeah, yeah start with a blog. Right. It's been the I would say, I would attribute is I say it's the most useful thing I've had in my career. Right, and I, I totally I totally support that because uh, as a conference organizer. And someone who loves the web and everything like that. It's like, like I tweet resources all the time, and usually they are people's blogs. And I don't tweet or promote. And I also have a newsletter. I really don't tweet and put links to other people's tweets, you know, or what. I put the links to medium articles, of course, but uh, I would rather link to your blog. And also, you know, that's someone who's researching the web, but also as a conference organizer, you know, and also who works on the web, you know. Uh, I, this Leo Baru story is, is one that I do because like I kept on going back to this web page. It was kind of this orange pinkish theme, <laughs> and it finally dawned on me after the third time reading the third article about CSS, you know, three or something like that, or whatever. It's like I should probably check out who this person is. And I was like, oh, it's you know, it's someone named Leo Baru, and I should probably like, I wonder if she wants to speak at my conference because she obviously knows what she's talking about, right? And so that's you know. Just, exactly. Yeah. You've got no idea who's reading, right? So I got a friend who um, he's actually become quite well known, and you you actually know him. I'm not going to name him, but you know him. Okay. Um, uh, and he he wrote a blog. He didn't really think many people were reading it. Yeah. It turns out one day um, a guy who was a hiring manager at Facebook yeah. ended up on my friend's blog, yeah. and he was reading this article, this kind of inconsequential article. But the guy reading it thought, you know, this is actually really good. We could use someone like this on our team. He reached out to my friend and said, hey, I just found your article by accident, but um, I'm a hiring manager at Facebook. Do you want, do you want to interview for Facebook? Yeah. Now, that was just because, like, like you say, you just happen to be on someone's site and you could offer that person something. It's a speaking opportunity. It's a job. That's amazing. Like, they just, we'll just go into them. So, I, yeah, you're completely right. right. Yeah, and you don't have to be on the web to do it. I mean, I feel like if it's any industry would uh, would benefit from it. So, if you're like, on the web or if you're just listening or you're marketing in web or if you're you know hiring in web like no just you know it doesn't have to be web but it just it could be any other industry but just saying like even if you're on periphery i think just having it out there and so and with github pages and jekyll i think it's just it's a no-brainer for people to, to get started right away so yeah yeah but definitely yeah, man definitely yeah because yeah, i feel like people also ask me like how, how can i speak and i just like just blog and meetups and then uh um uh, the new book from Laura, Laura Hagen, Hagen, I think that's how it's pronounced from uh, Event Apart, from Book Apart, about pu- uh, public speaking. I think that's pretty much is like just an awesome book on how how to get started, get in the industry too. So, but uh, yeah, so, but we're wrapping up. Uh, how can people find you on the internet and uh, and learn more about you? Uh, if anyone if anyone wants to find me on the internet, um, first bit of advice: don't Google my name because I share my name with a British serial killer. So if you Google me, you will get the wrong result. Um, so yeah, uh, CSS Wizardry is where I blog. So CSSWizardry.com. Um, if people are interested in performance, large scale CSS, architectural concerns, but yeah, yeah, that's about it. Okay, awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today and uh, and being here and sharing your advice and experts expertise. Uh, absolutely, my pleasure. And uh, I'll be seeing you. When will I be seeing you? <laughs> Uh, October 9th and 10th at uh, New Orleans for CSS DevConf. Absolutely. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be so good. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, see you then. Cool, man.